preached a message on Wednesday about the involvement of angels in our lives. You want to go back and listen to it because you'll be amazed when you see it. I've been up for hours. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to me for hours. We're going to go to spiritual warfare this morning. But I want you to understand something. Many times the angels came when God's people were at their weakest. Come on. When, when Gideon and the children of Israel were in such bondage and he was treading in the middle of the night in the threshing floor, hiding out, just trying to get a little bit of substance. Right, oh, somebody say substance. Just struggling because the armies of the enemy kept coming in and stealing the crops every time crop time came. Does anybody feel like that happens? You, you labor, you labor, you labor, and then just when harvest time comes, it's like the enemy comes and steals it. But at that moment, an angel showed up and spoke to him and said, Gideon, oh, mighty man of valor. I promise you he didn't feel very mighty. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> He didn't feel very mighty. But what the angel did, he came. He gave him a word and he strengthened him. Are y'all hearing me? The angel strengthened him. When Elijah had had a tremendous victory and now he's running for his life. Isn't it interesting? Sometimes out of what seasons of what seems the greatest manifestation of God in your life, you seem to go into the deepest pit. Am I talking to anybody here? Come on. Amen. What happened to him? An angel came and fed him and strengthened him. And, and some people say, some people say, thank you, Benjamin. Some people say, they say, well, he got discouraged. And so that was the end of his ministry because he ran from Jezebel. That wasn't the end of his ministry. That was the beginning of his legacy. No, 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 no. Come on, you got to hear me on this. That wasn't the end of his ministry. It's the beginning of his legacy. Because what did he do? What did God send him to do? Go find me, Elisha. He raised, and not only did he find Elisha, and he spent about 17 years with Elisha. Doesn't sound like an end of a ministry to me. Uh, Yo, someone said the devil's a liar. Not only that, but he had a school of prophets. Are y'all hearing me? He, he, this, he was not, he didn't, his ministry did not end in the season of discouragement. But in that place where he ran after having the great battle that happened at Mount Carmel and he called down fire from heaven, that would have been cool. I've tried that a few times, hadn't worked for me yet. But then again, I don't think God wanted to burn up McDonald's. Come on, y'all, look at me. <laughs> but anyways, she caught that down fire from heaven, had that incredible victory, killed the prophets of Baal. Then just a few days later, goes running for his life because that demon spirit that was on Jezebel, hello, came after him. He ran for his life. He's out there hiding. He said, Lord, I'm all by myself. You know, when you're under intensive battles, it's often you feel all by yourself. All by myself. Oh. Right? <laughs> Come on, you feel like, man, Lord, I was doing good and I was overcoming and I had victory and I had breakthrough and now I'm all by myself. And I bet you everybody else, where did he go? Whatever happened to Elijah? But in that moment, an angel came and ministered to him and strengthened him. Oh, come on, somebody say, devil, you're a liar. When Jesus was in the wilderness, being tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights, I promise you, it wasn't just the three temptations written down. Mark says he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine the intensity of that spiritual warfare? And yet the Bible says that angels came and strengthened him. Say, Lord, send your angels. I'm telling you, God's sending his angels to strengthen you. 
I said, God's sending his angels to strengthen you. I said, God's sending his angels to strengthen you. I, I, I miss my Mexico missions team. They were down in Mexico. My, my, my front row right here. I'm like, so excuse me. Amen, pastor, preach it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on. Somebody say the devil. Oh, good. Glory to God. There's strategy to that. When Jesus when the, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was struggling so much. Come on, amen? He was struggling. I love these guys. This is awesome. He's struggling. Come on, he's struggling. He's struggling to press through in prayer. He's facing the death and burial that's coming. He's facing his body being filled with sin, and he's struggling so much. The Bible says angels came down and strengthened him. And what did he do? When the angels strengthened Jesus in the battle of the wilderness, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, that he came out of the wilderness full of the Holy Ghost and power. When the angels strengthened Gideon, what did he do? He came out of the threshing floor and led a mighty victory to the children of Israel. Come on, come on, come on. Are y'all hearing me? When the angel strengthened Elijah, he went out and raised up Elijah, Elisha, and a school of prophets. And Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah. And when the angel strengthened Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went back and got the breakthrough in prayer, defeating the stronghold of the enemy. Isn't it interesting that in their weakest moments, God would release supernatural angelic power to strengthen them to do their greatest ministries? <laughs> Come on. Woo. I tell you, God is good. I want you to turn to the book of Jeremiah. Can we put the chalkboard up here for a moment, guys? Can you help me out? Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 4. Woo! Because we're going to spiritual warfare this morning. I said we're going to spiritual warfare this morning. Arama, karama. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, there are the angels of the Lord being dispatched right now to strengthen you. Uh, somebody say, I choose to believe it. Because you can sit there and choose to just sit there, but I'm going to choose to believe it. Hallelujah. In Jeremiah chapter 4, and I've got, God, pray for me, guys. I've got a long way to go in the Holy Spirit. We're going to deal with the five demons. In fact, let me put them up here, here. The five demon spirits have been standing against your financial breakthrough. I saw it in a vision. We'll get to that this week or next week. But I got to show you something. The first one is fear or worry. Then doubt. Then unbelief. Thank you. You know what I'm preaching. A mute spirit. And then torment. Now I'm telling you it's time we begin to take this on seriously and go after these five demon spirits. And you have and God is going to give you a new anointing and a new authority and a new strength to deal with this. You say, I feel weak. So did Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You say, I feel wore out. So did Jesus in the wilderness. You say, I feel all alone. So did Elijah out at the desert. You say, I feel like I'm overcome and the enemy's taking everything from me. So did Gideon. And in that same place, the angels of God came and ministered unto them and strengthened them. And the angels of God are coming down to minister to you and strengthen you. There is an anointing being released. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So put your hand in your chest. Say, God, you knew me before I was formed. 
which means there's no surprises. How can you let down somebody that already knows everything that was going to happen before it happened? Come on, before one of your days was lived, God knew it all together, the Bible tells us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say, I want you to say this. Say, I am not a disappointment. <laughs> all right, let me say it on this side. Maybe you like it better. I am not a disappointment. You say, well, Brother Steve, you don't know what I've done. No, you just don't know what he did. <laughs> before I formed you in your mother's womb, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, oh, this is crazy. I sanctified you. Jeremiah 1, boy, is the thing broken? It's not working right now. Before I, I sanctified you, I sanctified, I set you apart. I set you apart. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. God made up his mind about you before you were even born. How many of you ever had a prophetic word from God? Come on, how many of you ever had a prophetic word or promise from God for your life? You ever have that? Which means God spoke it, which means God's the one that's going to bring it to pass. <laughs> Do you think the devil and his circumstances are bigger than the promises of God? <laughs> Somebody looked out and said, devil, you're a liar. Say it again, say, devil, you're a liar. Hallelujah. Benjamin, just give me a little bit more if you don't mind. Then I said, ah, listen, listen to Jeremiah. He's like us. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I am. For I am a youth. Now, that word youth can be transfer, translated boy or child or anybody, you know, even an older teen. But it also can be translated servant or one of a lower class structure. I am just a servant. I am just immature. I am just, I'm not spiritual and mature like these others. I am just a servant. I'm of lower class. You're saying you ordained me to be a prophet, but I am too busy looking at who I think I am. Woo! How many of you know that's exactly what the devil tries to do to us every day? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You're just a child. You're just immature. You're just weak. You're just a failure. And he not only will hit you that at the early days of your Christian walk, but he'll come back in the latter days of your Christian walk and try to convince you that what you used to believe about yourself was more delusional and you just need to be real that you're just nothing but a little old servant. Am I talking to you? I got about three people that are with me here this morning. Come on. Somebody say the devil's a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. He said, I am. But God said, no, no, no. You got to understand. Before there was one of your days, I knew them all together. He said, I formed you in your mother's womb. And before you were formed, I called you. I ordained you. I sanctified you. I set you apart. Who are you to tell me that you're just a child? Who are you to tell me you're disqualified? <laughs> do not. But the Lord said, do not say. Don't you speak that out. Do not say, I am a youth. I am a servant. I'm of a lower class structure. I am immature. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Because my word in your mouth is not dependent upon your maturity. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. Have you ever thought about that? God's worth in the donkey's mouth was not dependent upon the donkey's stature. Because the donkey was just a donkey. I don't want to get fired from my show. <laughs> Come on. Come on. It's in the Bible, church. 
don't know about y'all, when I first started reading the Bible and I got to the book of Sol- Song of Solomon, I just had to close it up. I said, Lord Jesus, I can't read this right now. Some people say, what's in there? Be sanctified before you go there. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, but whatever, whatever I command you, you shall speak. My word is not dependent upon your stature, upon your maturity, upon, huh? But don't you say that I'm a nobody. Because I said you're a prophet. I said you're called. And because I said it, that's it. So you stop speaking against me. I said you're the head. Stop saying you're the tail. I said you're above. Stop claiming that you're beneath. I said you're whole. Stop claiming that you're broken. I'm not talking to anybody here. Or maybe I should just preach to myself because I need this today. Huh? Huh? I said you are more than a conqueror. Stop saying you're defeated. I said you're a child of the Most High. Stop saying you're a nobody. Don't you say that you're a you. And I'm going to put my word in your mouth and I'm going to send you to whom I want to send you to. Stop struggling about that. I will send you to whom I send you to. And you just open your mouth and you speak. And it might be just a word of encouragement. It might be a word of prayer. It might be a word of prophecy. It might be a word of rebuke. But you just do it. And I understand that my word in your mouth has power. (laughs) Verse 8. Do not be afraid of their faces. What does that mean? That means. And I don't know about you, but it's something that I know most people, including me, deal with. And that deals not only with threats. We can understand threats, but fear of rejection. Am I talking to anybody here? The enemy will try to intimidate you out of your role. Because he puts in you a fear of rejection. I don't want to say this or make this stand. What will they say about me? Will they love me? Will they accept me? Will they reject me? Will they hate me? And so we keep trying to protect every little thing instead of just trusting God has called me. And God's telling you, hey, listen, I got a mission for you, but you better not get afraid of their faces. That's why a lot of times I know in worship leading, sometimes in some crowds, I just close my eyes. Because sometimes God's people show up with not the best faces. You're sitting there saying, victory in Jesus. Well, that's an old song. but <laughs> And they're like, going, I'm like, Lord Jesus. Victory in Jesus. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Well, it's down there, buddy. <laughs> it, <laughs> it needs to get resurrected. Huh? Huh? Right? Don't be afraid of their faces. Why? Because I have called you. I have sanctified you from birth. I knew what I was up to. <laughs> and you might be feeling, see, I'm not trying to talk just to people that are baby, baby Christians at the early stages. Because we encourage people in this in the early stages. But what about people that have had seasons of victory and overcoming and accomplishment and blessing. And then they're like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then they're like Gideon in the, in, in the threshing floor hiding and everything's being stolen. Then they're, come on. Then, they're, then, then, then they're, li- they're in that place. I had it, now I don't seem to have it. And the enemy's trying to come back and rob from you the very destiny God put on you. And one of the ways he does it is try to get you to be intimidated at their faces. But your ability to overcome the fear is not 
rooted in your self-confidence. It is rooted in what He has said about you. Most of us, and we live in a society that spends a lot of time trying to build our self-confidence, our self-esteem. Build up your self-esteem. Build up your self-esteem. Here's the problem with self-esteem. If you build up your self-esteem, someday you're going to have some death to self. And you're going to have a confrontation of that self-esteem. And there has to come a point in our lives that we decide, I'm not standing bold and confident because of my self-esteem. I'm standing bold and confident because he knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. He sanctified me and he called me. Everybody say, I am called. Say it again, say, I am called. You are called. Those who he foreknew, he also did predestine. Huh? Uh, oh, no, no. Let's go there. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. I just got to throw this one in there. Glory to God. Woo! Glory. Romans chapter 8. And I think verse 20 something. Where, where, where does it say those who foreknew? 20 what? 29? Huh? I can't. I can't. 29. Let's put up verse, beginning with church, verse 29. Yeah, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And watch this, next verse. And those who he predestined, he also, he also, and those he called, those, these he also, and, though, and whom he justified, these he also. Someone say, I'm called, I'm justified, and I'm glorified. Ooh, let's get some, style. let's get, come on. Say, I, say, come on, get some attitude. I am called, I am justified. And I am glorified because before the foundations of the world, you were chosen. In him, before the foundations of the world, you were chosen to be holy and blameless in his sight. It's not about self-esteem. It's about recognition that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And he chose me and he set me apart. And he called me. Say it again, I am called. Do not be afraid of their faces. Man's opinion, as powerful as they are, do not underestimate the power of the fear of rejection. It drives most of our lives. Huh? And the enemy will hit you at the corest part of that in your heart. He'll come at you at the most. He'll, come on, come on, parents. You know what I'm talking about. There's almost no greater rejection than the rejection of your children. Come on, amen. He will come at you. I'm not talking to anybody here. He will come at you in the most delicate and sensitive areas in your life. The rejection of your children, the rejection of your parents, the rejection of a loved one or a spouse. Come on, huh? huh? The rejection of those that you've been leaning upon, the, that rejection. He'll come at you and wound you there to get you so sensitive. To rejection that you then begin to question who you are. But their acceptance was never a condition of your calling. And if their acceptance was never a condition of your calling, then the rejection cannot hinder your calling. Am I talking to anybody here this morning? Hallelujah. I know it's summer. I know there's graduation going on today, and I know all that. But, man, come on, someone say this is for me. If their acceptance, your calling is not conditional upon their acceptance, therefore their rejection does not hinder your calling. It only does in your mind. 
And God is speaking this into him. He said, do not be afraid of their faces. Verse 8. Why? For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Someone say, God's going to deliver me. It doesn't matter whether you're in the threshing floor and the enemy's been stealing all your crops. Come on, amen. It doesn't matter if you're in the wilderness and the enemy's been tempting you 40 days and 40 nights and you ain't got no strength left. It doesn't matter if you're in, the, in your garden of Gethsemane and you're literally sweeping drops of blood. It doesn't matter if you're in a lion's den thrown by an ungodly king. It doesn't matter if you've been thrown into a fiery furnace. It doesn't matter. He will give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot upon a stone. I am there to deliver you. <sighs> then, this is powerful. This is what's going to start happening to you from this day forward. Someone say from now on. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, oh, man, I'm telling you, get ready. You can be in the bottom of the pit, but when God touches your mouth. Hey! Come on, now, you, some of you have experienced that. You've been at the bar, and all of a sudden, started coming out of your mouth. You started prophesying. You're like, where, where, where did that come from? You started praying with a ferociousness. And where did that come from? The Lord touched your mouth. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what the circumstances say. It doesn't even matter what my lying mind is saying about me because of my failures and faith and weaknesses and shortcomings. I have been chosen by God and called by God before the foundations of the world. He sanctified me. He justified me. He set me apart. <laughs> Touch my mouth, Lord. Somebody say, touch my mouth. Say it again, say, touch my mouth. Woo! Shande. Shande. I know some of you say, well, I've been through that, and then I got hit again, and I'm intimidated. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody say, the devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. You say, why did I get hit so hard? Or why did somebody around me get hit so hard? Maybe. Maybe God was trying to get every bit of self-confidence and self-trust out of them so they would trust only in the arm of the Lord. Because many of us have a lot more self-confidence than we think we do. And we trusted more upon our self-confidence and our ability to encourage ourselves and build ourselves up. But then you get to those points where you got nothing and the Lord comes down and touches you. And you say, oh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. I'm having fun. I don't know about y'all. So he touched my mouth, and, he, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I don't know if we have any idea what that is. I don't know if we have any idea how big that is. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which I sent it and fulfill that which I desire. So when God puts his word in his mouth, his word will fulfill what he desires. He just needs you to open your mouth and speak it. So do this right now. Put your, put your hand and just say, I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Say, I'm the head and not the tail. Say, I'm above and not beneath. Say, I'm more than a conqueror. Say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And I have everything I need and an abundance for every good work. Oh, no, we got to do one more thing. One more thing. 
and I owe no man anything. Now, there are demonic strongholds. Man lives in two worlds. He lives in a natural world, but he also simultaneously lives in a spirit world. And the enemy is masterful at getting us to focus on the natural world and forget about what's happening in the spirit world. There are certain things that it's easy. We, we can say, oh, that's spiritual. But there's many things in our lives he keeps trying to get us to focus in the natural. And one of those areas is the area of wealth. Notice I'm not just saying money. I'm saying wealth. We got into a powerful revelation last week that God has actually put the wealth actually into the land. And that God promised to give the land. <laughs> to his people. Now, this battle is going to go on, and it's not going to be completely switched over before the return of Christ. Are you hearing me? Because this battle is going to be going on. But we don't have to sit back like Gideon, hiding in the threshing floor while the enemy's coming in, plundering the land. The battle is not going to cease before the return of Christ. But what is Jesus even himself going to do? He's going to descend. And he's going to come riding on a horse. And then he's going to come and he's going to put his foot on the land. And he's going to repossess the land. But there is going to be a partial reconciliation and release into God's people's hands during these end times. So we can do what God has called us to do. We got to understand this is a spiritual battle, and it's going on, not just for your finances, but that's a big area. Come on, amen? The enemy wants to keep you in bondage, but God wants to release his people. But these five demon spirits are bottling it up, fear, worry, doubt, unbelief, a mute spirit, and a tormenting spirit. But look what he says. Then he touched my mouth. And the Lord said, verse 9, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. Verse 10, See, I have set you this, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdom. Now what was going on in Jeremiah's day? In Jeremiah's day, there was, the children of Israel were in bond, were, were living in wickedness. And then the Babylonian captivity was taking place. And all of Israel was going to be plundered. But Jeremiah wasn't just speaking to his day. He was speaking to a day of restoration. Because of their sin and rebellion, they were plundered. The wealth and the land was taken. But God, at the end of Jeremiah's prophecy, and Jeremiah prophesied about the 70 weeks. And when that, we see that in Daniel, we saw that just the other week. In Daniel's restoration of prayer and intercession, where the angel came down and ministered to him. We saw that on Wednesday. But Jeremiah was God's servant to use to release these words that would absolutely come to pass. Now look what he says. To root out... To pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. I want us to look at these right now. Root out. Everybody say root out. God told Jeremiah four things. This isn't a, a, I want you to get it in your spirit because I believe this is an end time spiritual warfare revelation for us. This is not just called, God has spoken to me so many times in my life through Jeremiah chapter one. And I believe that's the anointing that's on this church. Come on, amen. And there were times where Jeremiah was celebrated and most of the time Jeremiah was despised. He was even thrown into prison. Come on, thrown into a pit. They treated him horribly, but he's one of the great celebrated prophets. 
Huh? To root out. You know what that means? It means to pull up. Formally to uproot. To pull an object out of the ground. A plant or other object out of the ground. Think about this. He's saying, I've given you an anointing to uproot every demonic root that's in your family, that's in your finances, that's in your church, that's in your neighborhood. I've given you an authority and an anointing to uproot. See, some of you have got curses of poverty in your family. Your family's been poor and poverty has fallen. Some people have drunkenness and alcoholism and violence in your family. But God says, I'm going to touch your mouth. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. And I'm giving you authority to uproot. Come on, you're not just going to do some weed whacking and cut it off at the surface. But you're going to go down to the root. Because when the root's removed, it doesn't come back. Hey, come on. Is somebody hearing me this morning? Is somebody hearing what the Spirit of God is saying this morning? God's saying, I'm going to touch your mouth. Get ready. I'm going to touch your mouth, and I'm going to give you words in your mouth, and it'll give you the authority to uproot that stuff, those weeds, those thorn bushes that have been choking you out every time you get prosperous. <laughs> to ruin, that's what it means, and destroy an object other than a plant with the implication that the destruction causes the ceasing of a state as an extension pulling out the roots of a plant, so killing a plant. Someone say, God's anointing me to root it out. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and to pull it down. Not only are you going to uproot that which has been already planted, but you're going to pull down that which has been erected. <laughs> that literally means to break down, to tear down, to make a physical impact on an object which results in its destruction. <laughs> God says, I'm going to give you an anointing to uproot that which is in the foundations. I'm also going to give you an anointing, and my word in your mouth is going to tear down that which has been erected. Hey! Somebody say, devil, you're a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. Now you pull it down and you uproot it. What are you going to do next? You're going to destroy Someone to destroy. That literally means to annihilate, to exterminate. Get those little bugs out. I remember when I first started going to New Zealand, and they'd start talking about, man, there were some bugs in that house, and there were some bugs in that person. I said, what are bugs? They said, demons. I said, okay. So we're, <laughs> we're going to exterminate those bugs. I was driving home yesterday, getting ready to turn onto my street, and the street that goes onto my street, and a big old rat, this big, goes running across the street. I said, what's this rat doing? And it came out of some guy's garage, and he was in there. I'm going to destroy that thing. Get an exterminator. To destroy, to not exist. To have a state of no longer exist. Is anybody ready for total victory? Is anybody ready for total victory? God's saying to you and me, I'm giving you a Jeremiah anointing. I'm giving you anointing to pull the roots out, to uproot it. I'm giving you anointing to tear down that which has been erected. And I'm giving you anointing to annihilate it. I'm giving you anointing to cease it from existing. And then the, th <laughs> oh, I like this on destroy. To be in a state of wandering 
in which the whereabouts of an object is unknown. <laughs> Didn't Jesus say that when a strong man comes in, he will empty the house and they will roam around in the wilderness wandering? That's what he's talking about. You're going to have such authority over that demonic power that they're going to go out and have to go wandering somewhere. You're, and, and, and no one's even going to know where they went. What happened to that stronghold? What happened to that thing? Where did that go? You're not going to spend the rest of your life fighting the same demon. Unless you make a peace treaty with it. Hello, somebody. God told, come on, what, are y'all hearing me? Don't make no peace treaty with it. Don't say, well, I just kind of, I kind of tell you, you'll back off a little bit. No, 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 no. He says, uproot it. He says, tear the sucker down, then destroy it. And then in case you ain't gone far enough, throw it down. Get some WWF stuff going on here. Root out. Pull down. Destroy and throw down. Who oh, throw down? I mean, this is. A, I mean, that's what it means. I mean, a hardcore throw down. Actually, literally, it means to oust, to push it out, to cause one to have. Watch this. Watch this. This is speaking about demons. To cause one, cause the demons to have lower status. By removing them from a position of high status. <laughs> Throw down those principalities. So it say, Throw it down. Throw it down. Throw it. Throw it. Throw it down. There is no stronghold in this region. That can stand up against us. Huh? Come on, whatever's been planted here by the enemy over the years, we command you, come up. We're uprooting you. Come on, somebody, somebody say that. Say, demons, get uprooted. Financial demons, be uprooted. Huh? The strongholds have been set up against your life. Come on, come down. Come on, pull them down. <laughs> Not only that, but I command you to be annihilated. Go around wandering like you, <laughs> nobody even knows where you are anymore. Be destroyed, and I'm ousting you from your authority. Jesus. But it's not just that. This is where some people go wrong. They get the idea and the understanding. I got the ability. I'm going to bind that devil. I'm going to cast it down. I'm going to root it out. I'm going to command it to go. But they don't do the next two. They don't start building. Remember what Jesus said? The strong man has a house, and one who's stronger than him comes in and takes, drives him out, and that enemy wanders. But then that enemy will come back to see if the house is occupied. And if it finds it's empty, he's going to go get seven more of his buddies, and it's going to be worse at the end. We need to go after spiritual warfare and deal with these things and realize God's put his word in our mouth. Not only to tear it down, but God's put in his word in our mouth to build up and to plant. Not all, we have to go after the negative demonic things that are there first. But then we have to go and start building and planting that which is right. Ooh. To build. It means to make or to build, to rebuild, to set up or erect a construction. This construction can be any size, from a small object to a city. To make something new, 
with a possible implication of using prior existing material. That's just a powerful word. God's saying, I'm going to give you anointing, and you're going to be able to take that which was damaged and broken and devoured, and I'm going to give you anointing to take the remnant. Look and say, Lord, it's nothing but remnants. He says, that's all right. You're going to be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of places to dwell in. <laughs> I'm going to give you an anointing to take the broken materials of what the enemy had done in your life and to build something brand new. Not just restore what you had, but to give you something better. Oh, come on, somebody. Woo! And then Benjamin, if you'll come, I can't, I can't even get fully to the five million. Whew. This is what build also means to establish a firm basis. For a standard or practice to prosper and to have an abundance. And then to plant. Let's just say plant. To plant seeds or root stock in the ground for agricultural purposes. To firmly embed it. <laughs> to be in a fastened state as an extension of having a plant firmly rooted to cause you to live or stay in a certain place as an extension of planting, to set up, to build, to construct, I like this, to construct a permanent structure. To construct a permanent, someone say permanent. Don't say I'm just a youth. Don't say I'm immature. Don't say I'm too weak. Don't say I failed too much. God says, before you were formed, in the womb, I knew you. And I called you. I sanctified you. I justified you. I'm glorifying you. I've I'm going to put my words in your mouth. I'm going to touch your lips. Don't be afraid of rejection. I've spent my life being rejected. I was the black sheep of the family. I was never the popular kid in school. I was the last kid they picked for sports, literally. I was the one the ninth graders would beat up in the hallways as a seventh grader. And I was the punching bag as they walked down. But God says, it doesn't matter what man says about you. I chose you. I called you, not because you were strong, but because I chose, I had mercy on whom I had mercy. <laughs> and because I chose you, I sanctified you. Because I sanctified you, I justified you. Because I justified you, I'm going to glorify you. <laughs> and some days, you're going to be on top of Mount Carmel, calling fire down from heaven, and the prophets of Baal are going to be destroyed. And some days, you may be running for your life. But don't worry, I got an angel waiting there for you. I'm going to give you an anointing to pull it down. I'm going to give you an anointing 
to root it out, to pull it down, to destroy, and to throw down, to literally push it out of the way. But then I'm also anointing you to build. And I'm anointing you to plant something that is permanent. I'm going to put words in your mouth that your prayers can establish and build something. Woo! No weapon formed against you shall prosper. This revelation applies to the wealth and the financial breakthrough that we're going into, but it applies to every area of our life. Hallelujah. Do not fall into the trap of the enemy that tries to convince you that it's hopeless. Told Jeremiah later in that chapter, he said, gird yourself. Speak to them everything I tell you. He said, they will fight against you. But they will not win, for I am with you. Fear not. For I am with you. Though you walk through the fire. Didn't say there won't be a fire. You'll not be burned. And through the waters. There are going to be some flood waters. You will not drown. Oh, Father, touch our lips. Oh, Father, touch our lips. I pray for the angels of God right now to begin to strengthen your people. Lift your hands and pray.